Hi, it's Mr. Mazurkowitz. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at human evolution. Now, I wanted to start with a very popular sort of diagram that comes up when we look at evolution, and that is the one that you see here. And a lot of times people look at this and they go under the assumption that what this diagram shows is that humans evolved from chimpanzees or that humans evolved from apes. But that's not true. What this diagram shows is not that we evolved from them, but that we share a common ancestor with them. So here's a better diagram to look at. This is something that we call a cladogram. And if we look at this cladogram, which is just an evolutionary family tree, we see that species like pongo, which is orangutan, or gorilla, or pan, which is your chimpanzee, and then homo, which is us, homo sapiens, it's not that we evolved from these organisms, but rather that we share a common ancestor. So we're all connected back to this point here. So don't think that humans evolved from them, but rather that we are closely related to them. So here would be the point right here where Pan, again, chimpanzee and humans share that common ancestor. That would be about uh, six to 10 million years ago. And again, what you see here is that chimpanzees, they evolved this way and we evolved a different way. So it's not that we came from them, but rather that we share that ancestor. And a way that we can make this diagram even, even better is that there are actually other branches of other species that have existed that have gone extinct that are even more closely related to us than chimpanzees. So again, one thing I just want you to pick up on is that we did not evolve from apes or chimpanzees, but rather that we share recent ancestors with them. So our lesson essential question is, what are the trends we observe in hominid evolution from early ancestors to modern humans? So we're going to go over the term hominid in just a second, but what we're going to notice is that by looking at fossils and looking at the past, we can see some of the basic evolutionary trends or these developments that led to modern humans today. So before we can continue, let's define, well, what is a hominid? So here in this picture to the left, you see a bunch of fossils of these things called hominids. And what they are, are any human-like species that has existed that's more closely related to us than chimpanzees. So as I already previously said, there were other species that are either our ancestors or think of them as your cousins that existed at certain points that have gone extinct that are more closely related to us than chimpanzees. So what looking at their fossils does is tells us, well, what are some of the basic evolutionary trends or the developments that we see over the course of let's say the last four million years. So with one of the first ones that we're going to look at is going to be the development of what we call bipedalism. Now if we take this word and break it down by bi just meaning two and pedal meaning feet. So in other words the ability to walk on two legs. This was one of the first evolutionary advancements that we see with hominids. And one of the first hominids that we see is going to be a group that we call Australopithecus. These guys existed about four million years ago and here's a very famous fossil that we found. We nicknamed this one Lucy. But what Lucy told us was that there were some structural changes that took place that led to bipedalism. One of those structural um, evolutionary changes is going to be right here in the hip or the pelvis. What we saw with Australopithecus is that they had more of what we call a bowl-shaped pelvis, which allows for upright two-legged movement. So we're going to look at some different pelvis structures here. To the left is going to be a gorilla. Uh, to the center is going to be Australopithecus, and then to the right is Homo sapien. What you notice with the gorilla pelvis is that the pelvis is more narrow. It's skinnier and it's longer. While with Australopithecus and with ours, Homo sapien, it is more of that bowl shape. It's wider, which supports the torso sitting on top of it. Another important thing to pick up on is also the thigh bones. You notice that with gorillas, the thigh bones point straight down. But while with Australopithecus and us, they point more inwards, again, supporting that upright movement. Now, some people ask, well, how do we know that Australopithecus was really bipedal? Maybe it had these sort of changes, but it really did get down on four legs, and that's how it moved around. Well, another thing that we found uh, in Tanzania and Africa are things that we call the Laetoli footprints. And what these were were fossilized footprints that we dated back to about 3.6 million years ago. And what it shows is signs of bipedal movement from these uh, group called Australopithecus, so people that were like Lucy. So right here is a left footprint, and over here is a right one. And actually, there's smaller ones right here next to it. There's a right one and a left one. So again, what it shows is that there were species that were walking around on two, le on, on two legs, excuse me, which we call that bipedalism. So that was one of the first things that we start to notice it, um, evolved early in that hominid evolution. Now, what bipedalism eventually led to was the freeing up of these guys here. Now that we're not walking around on our hands and legs, we freed up these hands, which is going to lead to our next evolutionary advantage, which is the use of tools. So now that we have our freed up hands, we can start using and manipulating objects to our advantage. So one of the first hominid species that we see start using tools is a group called the Homo habilis, which really translates to handyman. The reason we call them handyman is because we find a lot of these primitive tools with their bones. So here are just a sample of what they uh, were using. So I wanted to show this. Don't think that they were carving arrows and spears, but rather just picking up rocks and bashing them 
perhaps using them to uh, carve some meat off of bones. So that starts leading to a change in diet. Over time, the hand starts to change. Natural selection starts selecting for hands that are better at grasping these objects and using them. With that coming a change of diet, perhaps harnessing the power of fire. And really, it's all these changes of using hands and advancing that then is going to lead to our next step, which is going to be changes in the jaw and brain size. Now, one thing that we know for sure is that as hominids evolved, the jaw size began to decrease while the brain size began to increase. But there's a bunch of different ideas about how and why that happened. One popular idea is that, well, as we were changing our diet, as uh, hominids began to cook food more and uh, be able to use tools to carve meat, that required a less protruding in a smaller jaw because you're no longer having to grind plant-based foods. So as that jaw size decreased due to mutations, that also freed up the top part of the skull to hold a bigger brain. So here's a picture of a typical chimpanzee skull. And what you'll notice, two things, is that the bottom part of the skull or where the jaw sits is much larger, protrudes out in order to eat their sorts of diet and to be able to grind those plants. But the top part is much smaller where the brain sits. So again, as one of the ideas is that as that jaw size decreased, that freed up the top part of the skull to hold that bigger brain until you get to the point of your modern human. So here's a homo sapien skull, a much smaller jaw and a much bigger top part of the skull, which can hold a much larger brain. Now, with a much larger brain comes more intelligence and more complex social skills, so you can pretty much guess about how this might change the game for hominids with larger brains. But that's going to lead to our very last adaptation or our last trend that we see, and that is going to be language. Now, we're not 100% sure of when language evolved, but what we do know that is that there are a couple of requirements needed to develop a language. One of those, obviously, is a big enough brain for intelligence, but another part is going to depend on the location of this structure here, which is called the larynx. Now, in Homo sapiens and us, our larynx is located lower in our throats than in other primates. So, for example, chimpanzees, it is located a little higher up. The lower the larynx, the more different sounds and pitches you can make. So what we see is that other hominids did have a lower set larynx, which leads us to believe that they were perhaps capable of having a language. We can't ever be 100% sure, though, because you can't fossilize a language. So the best we can do is assume. So here, what do we get when we have a bipedal organism that is using tools that then has a smaller jaw and larger brain size and then develops a language? Well, what you get is today's modern human or what we call Homo sapiens. So I wanted to show you just a timeline of all the different hominids that have existed over the past few million years, starting from over here with Australopithecus. So that was where we said bipedalism first evolved up into modern Homo sapiens today. Now, there were over a dozen different hominids that once walked this planet. Um, and I just wanted to also show that at some point there were multiple hominids that existed at the same time. Notice as, uh, how Homo sapiens arrived, or excuse me, existed at the same time as Homo neanderthalensis, so Neanderthals, also another uh, species called Homo heidelbergensis, Homo erectus. So it's interesting to think that at some point you might have found multiple hominids walking this planet at the same time. But unfortunately, and fortunately for us, we were the only ones to survive, and there's many different possible explanations of what happened to all the others, but what we do know is that we're the only hominids to exist today. Now, the last thing I wanted to focus on is, well, how did humans come to inherit this entire planet? How did we uh, arrive on all these different continents that we know humans were on? Well, one of the most popular theories and most widely accepted is what we call the out of Africa theory. And what this theory pretty much states is that humans first evolved about 200,000 years ago in Africa. And it was from there that we spread to all the different continents. So from Africa, we were able to migrate up into Western Europe, through Eastern Europe, the Middle East, through Asia. Uh, down through the island chains to Australia, across to North America, down through Mexico and Central America, and then to South America. So it was that bipedal movement and intelligence and our social skills that really allowed us to populate this entire planet. Now, while there are a bunch of gaps in our knowledge about how humans evolved, and I didn't even cover half of the stuff that exists, I think it's important just to realize that humans are just like every other species on this planet. We are made up of cells, and we have DNA, and we are not left aside from this whole amazing process of evolution. And we can use things like DNA analysis and the fossil record to really look at how we came to be. I think we live in a really exciting time, and it's amazing to think about what future discoveries will make to help us better understand about our origins. Thank you guys for watching.